What's up, everybody? Welcome to another episode of Swan Signal Live. I'm your host, Senior Analyst Sam Callahan at Swan Bitcoin. Uh, we got another interesting show. There's a ton going on in Bitcoin, as always, and we got a great guest coming up. But before we get into the conversation, I want to bring up one of our sponsors. That's Marathon Digital Holdings. Marathon is the largest and most technologically advanced publicly traded Bitcoin miner and is also one of the most energy efficient. Uh, Marathon's primary mission is to enhance the Bitcoin network by sustainably increasing the amount of computational power, also known as hash rate, uh, to help make Bitcoin the world's most decentralized and secure monetary network. So go check it out. That's ticker Mara. Um, also, Pacific Bitcoin. Pacific Bitcoin is the festival that Swan puts on every year in October. That's October 18th and 19th. Uh, it's going to be a wonderful time. If you use the promo code SIGNAL, Right now, you can get 10% off on your tickets. And if you use Bitcoin, you can get an additional 21% off on those tickets. So go check it out at PacificBitcoin.com. we got a great list of speakers and events and workshops lined up. And it's going to be a great time uh, with this bull market just getting started. And so in this episode, we've seen a lot of developments um, with Satoshi Nakamoto, uh, which is actually one of the reasons why I got involved with Bitcoin. Initially, I was fascinated by Satoshi. And I'm still so grateful for what he created because it's obviously changed my life. Um, and I'm with somebody who really focuses in on the history of Bitcoin. And that is Pete Rizzo, who's the editor at Bitcoin Magazine and the editor at large at Kraken. So thank you, Pete, for coming on the show. It's great to have you on Swan Signal Live. Awesome to be here. Certainly a lot of intrigue on the subject. Uh, my inbox has been full for the last uh, couple weeks with uh, speculation, rumors. Uh, you know, it's, it's been an interesting time to be in the niche that is uh, Bitcoin history. So thanks for having me, Sam. Well, before we get into Bitcoin's history, let's uh, let's get into yours a little bit. I know this happens at the beginning of every mm. podcast, but um, I want to know <laughs> how long you've been following Bitcoin and how closely and kind of what got you interested in it. I'd be I'd love to hear that. Yeah, that's the question. Huh? I had a tweet out yesterday where I uh, admitted that uh, I watched the Bitcoin price range daily from $100 to $1,000, and I, I did not buy a single coin. And that that sort of stoked uh, <laughs> I think my more recent Twitter followers. Uh, you know, were under the impression that I was mining Bitcoin out of uh, you know Coke cans and milk crates. <laughs> uh, you know, back in 2010. But uh, no, so uh, <clears throat> you know, while I catalog the history. Uh, and I was quite early. I mean, I did join in 2013. I guess like now you consider that early. I thought mm -hmm. I was late. Everybody thinks that they're late, right? So, um, you know, I joined in 2013. For me, it was an interesting story, right? I was a writer out of college looking to write about something interesting. Uh, and every time I talked to people about Bitcoin, uh, it was an entirely different conversation. You know, there were tea farmers out in Asia who were accepting Bitcoin payments. There were comedians that were, you know, become Bitcoin millionaires. There were, uh, you know, people who looked like they could have been my dorm roommates, you know, who had come companies that were worth billions of dollars. Uh, so yeah, it was an interesting and fascinating time. And I started uh, contributing to then. It was just a blog and a, and a Skype channel, but it was called Coindesk um, oh. back then. And uh, yeah, it sort of took off and became sort of like the news source for the movement that kind of tapped the zeitgeist. So yeah, I've been a uh, journalist in the space for going on 11 years now. And uh, yeah, I have seen a lot. Uh, I don't know if that necessarily helps me understand anything, but uh, <laughs> certainly an interesting <laughs> vantage point uh, to have been here for so long. Well, that's over 10 years. And in Bitcoin years, that has to feel like 100 with how much happens in this industry. I mean, from week to week, it's, it's hard to keep track. And I just, mm. you know, in 2013, I think I remember Pierre Rochard. I had Pierre and Morgan on the show, and he was uh, he was pretty active back then as well. And he was uh, like, you know, back in 2013, he told Morgan, he's like, "This is happening." Like Cyprus, I think, uh, had the ball in, and, yeah. and they were like, "This is happening." Bitcoin's crossed 100. We're going to the moon, and obviously, uh, you know, <laughs> some things happened between now and then. But can you maybe talk about some of the attitudes back in 2013? and how that's kind yeah. of changed over time to where we are today, where we actually do seem like we're on the precipice of, um, you know, mainstream adoption. At least it's it's in the mainstream media. It's, it's being talked about by politicians. Like it's very, very different today than it was back then. 
Yeah, in some ways, in some ways, yes, some ways, no, right? I think it always feels like it's happening, like in any sort of bubble, right? I, I think one of the interesting things about the 2013 market, I was just on a podcast with uh, Mr. Charlie Shrem talking about yeah. this not too long ago, but, you know, you had Cyprus, governments kind of, you know, being involved in monetary policy and then people adopting Bitcoin that was talked about on the mainstream news, like that would have been on CNN, uh, you've had magazine covers, uh, you know, Bitcoin at that time was very much part of the internet story, right? Like WikiLeaks was yeah. big, there was the Arab spring the internet was kind of this new emergent like very political space that was like threatening the status quo and bitcoin was caught up in that story right you had ross ulbricht you know then he was under the pseudonym dread pirate roberts running the silk road uh but you know he was doing mainstream interviews with like forbes right like i, I don't know if people really know that but like he just you know there were you were, like one of the things that got me excited about the <laughs> industry was like the founder of silk road just he did a forbes interview anonymously and i was like oh people are buying drugs on silk road i had some friends who were doing it who started mining so again it was just very like uh, but, you know, the narratives were a little bit different, right? Like then the focus was very much on payments. It was like merchant adoption was like really the big thing. And the value propositions were kind of like faster transactions and no chargebacks. I was watching a video with Vijay Boyapata from 2013 the other day i messaged him and it was like you know those are the value points right like bitcoin's like gold but it's like you can move it for free and like uh you know there was uh, because again we didn't really understand bitcoin as a store of value because it hadn't been around for that long right it was only four yeah. years old right so there was no understanding that it could have stored value over time pierre of course one of the uh, early prophets or visionaries who kind of made that connection and kind of established some of those early blog posts. But yeah, it was understood very differently. And I think um, one of the things that fascinates me about the Bitcoin history is that from epoch to epoch or however you want to think about it year to year, there is a lot of variance in like how Bitcoin is understood. There's, there's a lot of things that maintain over time. Uh, but then how that actualizes into discussion, um, you know, a few years ago, uh, the conversation was mostly on, you know, kind of uh, inflation and like treasuries, people adopting businesses were going to kind of start adopting Bitcoin treasuries. We've seen some of that. But right now, three years later, MicroStrategy is, you know, kind of still the only one, uh, you know, of a, of a few others. Right. So, uh, yeah, it's interesting how uh, I think in many ways, I think we're just we're I like to think that we're all kind of as Bitcoiners trying to collectively understand Bitcoin and we get a little bit better each time. Uh, you know, where we get more perfect definition of what it is, but I, I like to think that we still have some things to learn about it. But and even that's a little bit controversial. Yeah, right? no, and and I I think nobody's an expert on Bitcoin. I think that's one thing you learn after being in it for a long time. Um, there's it's just right. an endless rabbit hole, and there's so many different facets of this technology to understand. Um, and it seems like maybe a lot of us are right about different things, but it's the timing that's hard, right? You know, like. Everyone was like corporate adoptions happening, like you mentioned, MicroStrategy. And maybe we're just a few years off of that, right? They thought that that was going to happen in 2021. That was going to be a big narrative. But maybe we needed like the FASB rule changes to make that easier. Maybe more education was needed. Um, maybe they just had to understand what was wrong with the fiat system more. Before. Yeah, I mean, I wrote my first story about a Bitcoin ETF in 2013 when <laughs> yeah. Winklevoss applied, you know, for the first Bitcoin ETF. And I remember, you know, Barry Silber trying for years to kind of, you know, or, you know, he did launch the Bitcoin Investment Trust, but that was kind of like a OTC markets vehicle for a long time, pretty niche. Uh, so yeah, it, it is interesting. You do see this this kind of ideas kind of come and go. They emerge, uh, but like sometimes they have a long history, right? In the case of the ETF, it was a 10 year Ten industry years. effort. Uh, to get this activated. And, you know, the results so far have been demand beyond, you know, people's wildest expectations, right, in terms of uh, what we've seen. And that's that's been exciting. And uh, but, you know, also uh, maybe the waiting kind of, uh, you know, psyched us out. We didn't we weren't we weren't quite ready, ready for it. We had waited so long. <laughs> I know. I mean, I, I remember that was like an ongoing meme. I mean, I've been in it since uh, 2017, right. but it was like ETFs right around the corner, ETFs right around the corner. And now that it's here, I think it's blowing people's expectations away, even despite, uh, you know, the anticipation around them. Um, but one mm. of the things that I thought about with those ETFs is it's actually a blessing that it, they were denied for so long because it allowed more Bitcoin to be distributed, um, less, I guess, centralization risk of, of a majority of the Bitcoin supply being hoarded. If, if an ETF was launched in 2013 when Bitcoin was still very young and the block reward was still much higher, um, perhaps we would have had more centralization. Do you have any thoughts about that, uh, about whether it was a blessing or not that they were denied for so long? 
Yeah, it could be. I mean, I'm not an expert in market formation, right? I think that uh, certainly it did, uh, you know, it has contributed to this idea that Bitcoin is currently mainstreaming and it does feel like a validation. I'm still, I would say, skeptical of the ETFs. I do think that it is very interesting to see that there is such a community support for the ETFs, given that they, you know, essentially, you know, in many ways kind of contradict a lot of the things that we have preached, right, as kind of Bitcoin only, Bitcoin maximalists, right? Um, we've really wanted to prioritize self-custody, uh, we really want to get Bitcoin, you know, people to adopt Bitcoin and actually join the network, right, and actually be participants in it. And the ETF kind of runs in contrast to that. So I don't know. I mean, I'm still looking at what's going on with BlackRock and I'm, you know, I'm, I'm sympathetic to the set of Bitcoiners that are a little bit worried about this, right? Yeah. It is an increasingly yeah. large amount of Bitcoin is in the hands of institutions that are easily regulatorily captured. Uh, it's unclear what their motivations and intentions in these products are. I mean, it's currently my thesis that this isn't the last like crypto related ETF. I mean, I can't believe that BlackRock is seeing this demand and is not lining up ETF two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten that is going to re repackage and continue to push these type of products. Now that they've seen that demand, you've seen Larry Fink talk about tokenization and use some sort of the crypto industries kind of standard dialogue to discuss you know, what he's doing with the Bitcoin ETF. So yeah, I, I still remain pretty skeptical of what's going on in, on Wall Street and with the institutions. I mean, obviously it's great that they're dipping their foot in, but I don't think we should confuse that with them sort of agreeing completely with our ideology because I think, you know, the Bitcoin ideology, at least going back to Satoshi and, you know, his intent, it really was to undermine, you know, the entirety of the structure that, you know, BlackRock and <laughs> other Wall Street uh, groups essentially benefit from, are a part of. Uh, so I, I don't think that we've seen the last of that. And if anything, I think, the higher the price, the sooner we might head to a tension point like this, because essentially, you know, you got to look at the fundamentals, right? It's like, what is Wall Street kind of change here for uh, the whole calculus of, you know, we're trying to move the financial system and the monetary system of the world over to this new network. Uh, some of us, right? I don't know. Again, it's hard to tell what's controversial these days. Um, and, uh, you know, that's our goal. Is that Larry Flink's goal? Is that BlackRock's goal? Um you know, I don't, I don't, I, I can't imagine, but you know, I'm waiting to be surprised. Yeah, no, I, th I mean, obviously, um, working at Swan, I mean, we always try to educate people about why self custody has its advantages over a Bitcoin ETF. I guess I'd like to think about it a little more optimistic in terms of it being kind of a top of funnel uh, for people to gain exposure to it, just ease of access, uh, convenience for them to gain exposure. But then, as they own some, they start to learn about it. Um, then they realize, oh, I would actually want to hold this in a sovereign way, the way that it was meant to be held. Um, that's my hope, at least. I mean, do you have any thoughts about that? Because I think you're right. I mean, these these people are going to want to make money. They want to see their ass AUM increase over time so that they can collect more money on the fees. Um, they're not incentivized for people to take self-custody. But my hope is that more and more clients will start to understand it once they learn about it, once they own exposure to the price. Uh, they'll want to own the real Oh, for sure. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I totally agree with you. I think, look, you got to start somewhere and anything is, you know, I think any exposure to Bitcoin is ultimately good. However, you know, you want to evangelize in your own life. I think I'm just saying uh, there's been a tendency, I think, to kind of misconstrue like their acceptance and the popularity of the ETF with the validation of, you know, I would say it's sort of the Bitcoin maximalist type of ideology, right? So essentially, uh, you know, the idea that Bitcoin is, you know, a monetary invention, it's essentially, uh, you know, this new type of monetary network that we've never seen before and that we can build, you know, you know, the entirety of the kind of financial structures off of or, you know, our best attempt. Uh, so I think that, you know, if you think about what the, the ideology is and going back to these Satoshi emails, you know, what do we see? We see somebody who is, you know, very concerned about, you know, making a network that can avoid the type of issues that have historically been involved with the government management of money, right? Satoshi makes direct appeals both with the kind of Genesis inscription and the blockchain with the, you know, no more bailouts for banks, uh, but really does talk about, and there's a great new quote in here about, you know, him, this is a great money if people want to take it up, right? He talks about kind of this grassroots adoption mm -hmm. of this money that's outside the existing system. So, you know, I mean, again, I think that to me, that's the meta narrative, right? Like Bitcoin is the story of a, a single person's invention, right? He invented and he did something great where, where many other people failed. And, you know, the um, interesting thing with inventions is, you know, it, it's kind of funny. I wrote this in one of my early pieces. I have this piece called The Last Days of Satoshi, but uh, it's kind of a deeper look into Satoshi's uh, kind of history and involvement in the project. But, you know, to be an inventor, it isn't really just good enough for you to invent something. 
there's a couple of second layers to that, which is like kind of funny if you think about it. Like you also have to evangelize for it, right? I said like Satoshi had like the double curse of every great inventor, which is not only did he have to invent something new, right? You think about Albert Bell or, mm -hmm. you know, Albert Einstein. People. Not only do they have to kind of teach the world something new as possible, uh, or sorry, not only do they have to invent it and prove that it's mathematically practically true, they have to convince other people, right? right? They actually have to convince the people that the world has changed. That was the the you know verbiage that I use. It's not only do you have to change the world, you have to convince the world that it has changed. And then I think, you know, in, a, in an invention that is kind of at the scale of Bitcoin, um, then those kind of followers have to go forth and then they have to bring about that change, like in a lot of ways, right? Like, uh, you know, the people who invented electricity, I mean, they had to go out, they had to go forth into the world and string it with wires and like bury cables under the sea. And they had to like string them from poles from sea to sea to sea, right? Like there was this tremendous like idea of like, if you think about the electrical grid, yeah. like as a network, like what a tremendous human undertaking that was. And, you know, we don't really focus on that part of the story. I'm sure there are books about like the history of electrical grids and just, you know, electricity in general, but, you know, we're left today with Tesla and edison and they're kind of dual and that's you know what we have inherited from this but really it's like the human story of that was a lot broader and a lot more it took a lot more time right again it wasn't just this person invented something there was all these second third order effects and i think we're into those second third orders effects and it's you know um we have to be mindful that it's it's going to take time but that also you know i'm sure that like Edison, uh, you know, I don't know who was who would have been the incumbent industry, the can candle makers, yeah, the I candle guess. Candle makers were like probably pretty pissed off. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like weren't super excited that like he made the light bulb, right? I'm you know, I'm sure we don't like know they weren't tweeting at the time, so we don't know, but I, I'm sure there would have been a the no electricity people would have been like a whole subset of like past Twitter, yeah, right, where they were just you know super bullish on candles. Candles, we're going to, you know, you can't take the whaling industry out. You know, we need whale blubber. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, they were afraid of the new technology, uh, right, too. Electricity it was basically the beginning, the early years. Right. You're just trying to convince people, like, look at this. Like, I have light. It's night. You know? I mean, it's legitimately, you know, like, I mean, if you focus on, like, what is actually happening, where it's like, yeah, you're actually, like, piping electrical current, like, through your house, like, at a, at a pretty tremendous scale, right? I, I just had a kid, like, over the last year, you know, there's she's taking her fingers and, like, light switches <laughs> left and right, you know? It's like, okay, well, you know, I'm sure, like, it would have been easy to be concerned about something like this, but now we just, li you know, we, we don't even notice it. Like, you wouldn't even think twice to, like, there could be a half-exposed electrical circuit in your room and you would just... Yeah, no, I think you make a great you know, so point about it just takes time to bring people to the cause to understand the new invention but then also want to build on it right entrepreneurs to come yeah. in and build build the systems that are required and the infrastructure that's required to actually make the invention worthwhile for society and i think we see uh, that in in bitcoin right now it reminds me of andreas antonopoulos talks about this too with the automobile right the automobile in the beginning there wasn't like roads gas stations you know right. you, you needed right, yeah. all this infrastructure in order to make the automobile what it is today um maybe we're at the same stage right now with bitcoin we're kind of coming right. out of that early uh stage where we had to basically evangelize for its purpose and just teach people about what it is but now we we have to build the the infrastructure we are building the infrastructure well, I think, uh, one more point i would make on that is i think we are at a little bit more of a saturation point on this right because i think that uh if you think about the modern world right there's no more west right there's nowhere else for you to go if you have a new idea that you really want to establish and i think back then it's like sure there were no roads sure there was no gas stations but there was plenty of room to build them i think one of the interesting things with bitcoin is it comes at a time when like you know the global pop populace is you know eight to ten times larger and it, it does feel saturated right so where do you build the new thing uh sure you're building it in cyberspace but there's there's the physical imprint on it and i think you know if you look at now the anti-technology movements you look at like the people who are anti-mining mm -hmm. right or anti what are they objecting to? They're sort of objecting to like reusing these existing resources. They're right. They're saying these things exist in a certain way. And it's harder to just like build them new, right? Like to build a new Bitcoin mine, you need a, you need a lot of space, right? Like you need a place like Texas that's accommodating. But I, I think there's an interesting thing where it's like Bitcoin is at a time when the world feels very developed and it, it feels like new ideas have a harder time. Like, you know, so it'll be interesting to see if that tension kind of persists. I don't, I don't have a great handle on that. But. Yeah, the, the digital frontier. Uh, that we're yeah. looking upon <laughs> and bitcoin kind of stands yeah. on that and you're right i mean the uh the attack on uh you know energy uses in general it's not just bitcoin i mean you see it against ai now um there's any kind of uh, consumption of energy for any kind of new yeah. technology 
uh, people are afraid of it. I mean, it's the same thing throughout history. And uh, we brought up the Satoshi emails. And actually, that was one of the things that he answered in these emails. For anyone who doesn't know, as part of a court case that we'll maybe talk about too, uh, there was a release of S Satoshi emails that had never before been seen. One was with Anna Back, and one was more extensive with an early developer, Marty Malmi. And these were between like uh, 2009, uh, 2011. And you just get to see a little bit more about who Satoshi might have been as a person. You kind of get to see like how he thinks a little bit. So I found it really interesting. And one of them, he was asked whether Bitcoin is harmful for the environment. And Satoshi had a really interesting answer. He said, ironic if we end up having to choose between economic liberty and conservation. But he said, proof of work is the only solution to make peer-to-peer e-cash -peer e work without a trusted third party. And it's fundamental to coordinating the network and preventing double spending. And then he said, unfortunately, proof of work is the only solution I found to make it work without a trusted third party. Even if I wasn't using it secondarily as a way to allocate the initial distribution of the currency, proof of work is fundamental uh, to coordinating the network. If it did grow to consume uh, a significant energy, I think it would still be less wasteful than the labor and resource intensive conventional banking activity it would replace. Uh, um, yeah. And I wrote in my tweet storm on that. I think that by far Satoshi is like most fascinating new quote. Me too. I think, you know, Satoshi is not a very eloquent person. And I think in, you know, his public posts on the forums and in emails, he's very measured. And I think this is a really rare because it's one of his first couple emails with, uh, you know, the contributor that got released here. It's it's very descriptive. He's talking about like choices that he made when building the network. A very rare kind mm -hmm. of quote in the lexicon where and also very like eloquently worded right here we have this idea between choosing he even at that stage where bitcoin was worth nothing you know was realizing that you know we might have to choose between liberty and conservation that he was posing that question to society i mean again i think it just gives you the level of like which, which satoshi actually understood bitcoin right i think that's one of the um you know tensions like in the, in the bitcoin history right is like how much did satoshi really know did he did he complete his work or is it a work in progress that we have to complete i would actually argue that's like kind of a fundamental fissure point in bitcoin maximalism that that people have different views on but you know here we get that he was at least a you know this wasn't like a silly putty thing where he stuck something in like you know the the vat and like something was produced right like this was the system was built with a lot of intent he looked at a lot of different ways to build it and i think like what a powerful quote just in terms of you know uh how much he says in so little space when you know a lot of a lot of his writing is like highly technical and and doesn't make that leap to being empathetic with the reader yeah no, i know i it was very um eloquently put like you mentioned and i thought you know comparing it to the traditional banking system is a point that we say nowadays, but you didn't really hear it back then where he talks about the cost, uh, you know, less than the banking fees, the brick and mortar building, skyscrapers, junk mail, credit card offers coming in the mail. He mentions. Yeah. I thought that was funny. And, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, he does have a prior. I think it's worth noting he does have a comment about this that's roughly similar. So one of the funny things, so the I think the part of the emails that people are less familiar with is that Marty Marty Malmi as was, went by the codename Sirius. He was Satoshi's second kind of contributor. So once Hal kind of left, and you know, kind of uh, I think at, at that point he would have learned that he was diagnosed with yeah. ALS, right, and stopped contributing. Uh, and so Marty was the one who kind of takes it up. Yeah, he's he's a, you know, finished co college students, 19 years old. Uh, so you know, really a lot of their conversation though is it's you know they were because they actually created the forums together and because they actually launched the website and made the faq a lot of their backroom dialogue is kind of them workshopping things that were published so actually you know even though we have 120 new pages of emails here one of the interesting things is a lot of this is published in some way so like myself like i've gone back through and looked at the timestamp of like okay here's every instance of the bitcoin.org website so over two years when satoshi was the kind of owner and operator of the project you know how did their language actually change about how they were describing it so what was interesting is you know i was able to piece together from that and come together some like archaeological assumptions right you just see that at some point in 2010 he stops describing Bitcoin as anonymous, right? Early on, he talks about this a lot. He, you know, he's open about how he thinks you can use Bitcoin with an anonymity. That's kind of gone. And there's an open question. Okay, well, was it Satoshi who decided to do that? Was this sort of just Marty kind of deciding to say, oh, I'm a marketer. I'm going to position this like a little bit differently. But here we see that it is actually Satoshi's decision. Satoshi kind of gives his, you know, perspective on it. So in a lot of cases, like we know the results. You can, you can kind of see if you like look back, you're like, okay, so this happened. There was a definitive thing here but then what's the sort of this backstory like who who of the two of them 
was particularly involved? And then what does that say about Satoshi? So that's like the level of granularity that when I was reading these emails, I was making. Because essentially, like, I'm very familiar with the public record, which is, you know, there's there's emails out there, right? There's other developers who have released emails with Satoshi, and Satoshi did, you know, I think in total, write a couple thousand messages in the forums, right? So there, <laughs> there's a very robust set of literature of him answering different things. Uh, but here, what's interesting is you get to see like some of these big moments, like what's the behind the scenes? So like, you know, does Satoshi actually know that he had kind of failed to make Bitcoin anonymous, right? Or was he, did he always think that that was kind of a hope, but he didn't know, right? So getting even a small detail like that, I think is important because again, as Bitcoiners were trying to keep up the network, I think interpreting what Satoshi would have wanted is a big kind of tension point, right? So yeah, or does it matter? I mean, do you think it matters what Satoshi wanted when he, he, there's no way of knowing? I mean, maybe he foresaw like how Bitcoin would evolve over time, but I mean, he would have to be have crazy foresight. But do you think it even matters what Satoshi may or may not have wanted all the way back in 2011, given that Bitcoin has changed a little bit since then? Um, do you think that matters? Well, I mean, obviously, I think his opinion matters because we know that he was such a particularly talented and great individual, right? So he was somebody who understood the current science at the point that Bitcoin was invented so well that he made a net new invention, right? Like he, again, he like changed the world by doing something that no one believed could be done. So you have to kind of like put it on totally. that level. So it's like, to what extent would you like think that that person's opinion is important? <laughs> Uh, well, they did the thing that was, you know, we talk a lot about how great Hal was yeah. or how great Nick Zabo was or maybe even some of these other cypherpunk icons. But again, like Satoshi will be the one that endures because he is the person who figured it out. And so history generally, you know, when it kind of reduces over time, you're left with kind of these great figures, right? Like Satoshi is the Edison mm -hmm. of, you know, what Bitcoin becomes. So, you know, essentially then the tension point is, you know, are we bound to what he thought about things? I think Bitcoin has answered that question, right? The Bitcoin development community has largely moved past Satoshi and kind of, you know, is now well into kind of rewriting his software, well into, you know, his idea of how Bitcoin would scale has been pretty thoroughly debunked uh, in terms of like, you know, it wasn't uh, a valid way to approach the project or there wasn't a consensus that the project should scale that way. Uh, but then we're left with something new, right? Which is that somebody else has to become the next kind of great inventor, right? And so where do you start? I think you start at the same place Satoshi did, which is, you know, you go to the relevant literature, you know, here in his emails with Adam back, you know, we get a greater understanding of specific papers that they discussed. Obviously, Adam Back's emails for somebody who's, you know, was really hoping for this to be a treasure trove, a little bit disappointing. <laughs> Adam kind of just leaves, he left Satoshi on, yeah, red, you know, like Satoshi. Him and he didn't even read his paper right like uh you know i like think about that as as a funny kind of thing right now where you know uh the the great person kind of approaches you with a great idea and you just you know adam bath had to go to the bathroom he had to go walk the dog you know there's just so many other things he was doing at the time it was just super busy yeah uh and you just didn't get back to him right and it's it's funny now to look at that uh interaction but um yeah wish wish there were more in there but yeah we do get a level of specificity of like you know okay papers that they discussed but yeah i do think it's important right satoshi i mean he however you want to paint the bitcoin story right and i do think there's different ideologies that paint it differently right in the bitcoin maximalist world our view is that satoshi's invention is you know either complete or we have to complete it depending on your flavor of maximalism that you prescribe to in the crypto world you know their view is that satoshi was great but you know they had to do all these other things to reinvent and really unlock the potential yeah. of his things and the no coiners are still you know uh, rejecting his invention right so I, I like to categorize in that way because i think that you know, great thinkers are often looked at differently depending on who you ask, right? Like in the crypto world, Satoshi is still venerated, right? You see the bankless people like tweeting about Satoshi and like Gary Gensler was, is right? even uh, tweeting about how great he is. Gary Gensler, <laughs> big Satoshi fan, yeah, great. I mean, he's a big be, Satoshi fan. I mean, yeah, I wonder with Gary Gensler, you're like, oh, he, this man was so great that he, uh, you know, like, I had to spend years litigating. Everyone. <laughs> it, was like, it was like Halloween. <laughs> I think it was the white paper. You know, he was like. Is it the but, anniversary of Satoshi's great, great paper? Yeah, well, it's keeping him busy. You know, he's really been able to hire a lot of people. It's been a great time to be Gary Gensler since Satoshi was invented. You know, I think uh, really his primary contribution to the world was just increasing the budget for the securities <laughs> uh, enforcement agencies of the United States. I think. Yeah. It really swelled to record numbers under post Satoshi. It's been a great time. The Adam Back emails were interesting. I thought the most interesting part was that Satoshi. 
I mean, maybe Satoshi is playing 3D, like 4D chess, and he did know what B money was, the the way die paper. Oh, but yeah. in the emails to Adam, he he says he doesn't know about it. And so what you can conclude oh. is that anybody who did know about B money or talked about it previous to those emails uh, are not Satoshi, uh, which which I thought was interesting. Yeah, you never know. Like so, uh, Truth Bonsall was. Uh, yeah, like, yeah, Drew know, was saying that. Yeah. Yeah, and it's like you know, well, you never know. Like in chess, you know, are you playing the full move, right? Like you know, there's there are people who use that same uh, instance to say that okay, well, maybe it was Wei Dai because if it was Wei Dai, he wouldn't have cited himself. So maybe he <laughs> made a mistake. True. That's true. So there's like, so many levels of this that you can kind of like armchair quarterback, and this is where the Satoshi theory is like kind of spin out of control, <laughs> um, and kind of like you know, or you know, was it Adam kind of creating a paper trail with himself? Mm -hmm. You know, you know, there's like you know, you can never disprove. <laughs> everything so whether you know how do you take it at do you take it at face value or you, or you to kind of go into the into the conspiracy uh kind of or not conspiracy i guess that word's been politicized but like you know it's the theoretical all the different potential realities right well which reality is your preferred uh satoshi but yeah i you know i would say the one conclusion that i've kind of come to on reading these to be honest is i think satoshi was younger i th actually really from seeing this extent of uh Kind of correspondence from him there's a few kind of remarks for this he uses a cut uses a couple words i'm not sure if i can repeat them on this platform but they're very like millennial-esque you know there's a word that begins with an r that he uses kind of casually that i thought was pretty mm -hmm. funny uh, but you know i think that uh and like thinking of him starting from hash cash right as with that kind of idea um you know uh and maybe not being familiar with some of the other literature i i often think that like you know because i'm pretty sure and i'm close to publishing a thread on this but like I'm, I'm i've always been pretty adamant that i don't think how finney is satoshi right like i don't i don't think that at all uh, and one of the reasons that i don't think that is i think it would have been very hard for somebody like how to like fake a conversation with somebody else who was also an expert and then have that conversation with other experts because if you think about like what would their in a world where how finney is satoshi the correspondence on the cryptography mailing list is him having a conversation with himself and then faking a conversation between experts among experts. And I think it's very unlikely that somebody who was that good at like one field, computer science, was also so good at dialogue, right? Like deception, character creation, writing, that he like created a fictitious character, created this like elaborate scenario with himself like new enough to like make him uneducated or like not leave any direct connection. Like there's just like so many like things that he would have had to have done to get that right. Uh, that it's just become super unlikely. Uh, so I think that, um, yeah, the evidence here that, uh, that Satoshi is somebody Younger. who, you know, was maybe unencumbered by the extent of knowledge that Hal had, right? Because Hal did know every paper. He was the guy who tested every new digital cash project. And I mean, I've gone through Hal's archive Hal tested everything. There's like a guy from 95 who has the software called Magic Money. Who's the first guy to download it? Mm. Hal. It's a guy with a pseudonym. The project doesn't even work. The software, you like, you actually like, you control how much money you make and like the other person can make as much money. Just like wacky systems, right? Like these are the flying cars <laughs> of their era. You know, there's like in the, in the late 90s, again, there was this other guy, Anonymous, uh, is called Trust Bucks, like, you know, another thing that like doesn't work. So Hal is like the perennial kind of first user and, and he would have had this like body of just like understanding about it. And I often think that like when it comes to, you know, people doing great things. This is why you see a lot of great artists are usually younger is they're kind of unencumbered by the past. They don't, they don't feel the need to like be respectful of like each and every idea to like really weigh and consider, you know, all the options. Like what, it, what is every single thing that, that went wrong? And, you know, Hal's contribution like most previous to Bitcoin would have been RPAO, which was, you know, mm -hmm a very different type of network didn't use hash cash at all there was like a central operator that was him and that was kind of the sum of his ideas and then sort of then a couple of years later have a totally differentiated idea uh, seems unlikely and yeah again yeah. i don't know i think like people who are younger are just you're able to innovate with you know when you think about your taste as a kid like, you know, I'm not a kid, but like maybe up until like your 30s or something, like, you know what you like and you know what you hate. And the world is just like very black and white, you know, like I'm I, Satoshi feels like a person who's like, oh, yeah, I like hash cash. And, you know, yeah, I haven't even read this other stuff. Like, fuck that. I'm not even interested in that. Um, <laughs> like, I, I'm, I'm just going to go forward with my version idea and then to have the confidence to like pull that off. Yeah. Right. Like you have to then believe that you can make a new monetary system. 
I don't know, like an older person, like I'm not, I'm not sure would have been able to have that level of confidence and almost like chutzpah, you know, you don't yeah. have to <laughs> really believe in yourself. Yeah. You know, I mean, it's almost way. like those young startups who like, they wouldn't have even started if they were older and understood how difficult it would have been to be successful, but then they pull it off because they had this like confidence. Well, I don't want to say ignorance, yeah. but like, just kind of like, Hey, we're going to do this. I think that's part of it. You know, to be honest, like, I think there is sort of like a oh, naivete would probably yeah. be the right thing. Right. Like what, like, I think like Satoshi was like just naive enough to think that it could work. Right. Like he had read the stuff and he was like, Oh yeah. Like, you know, we just, we, we choose between Liberty and like energy resources. Great. Like, yeah. We choose Liberty. <laughs> yeah. Right? Obviously. You know? obviously no we choose liberty. <laughs> Satoshi. Uh, no he also, I think he used the word newbie in it as well. Which I was yeah. Like, there's a lot of those like, kind of kind of like I, I've never really heard a boomer, you know, say newbie, you know, you just don't really, uh, but I think you're right. You know, I think Satoshi yeah. will be remembered. He's uh, the Prometheus who brought us fire. I also think about like, yeah the greatest inventions spur on more inventions, like more inventors that are building on top of that invention. So like electricity, we talked about before, mm -hmm. obviously, you know, things like computers, like a blender, you know, anything, all these inventions that spur from the invention of electricity, it just makes you think like how many things are going to be built on Bitcoin. Um, maybe we don't even know what they, they'll be like, right? Be careful, you might, you might be, uh, there might be some uh, unorthodox ideas. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, exactly. It's um, a, yeah, look, I look, I think so. I mean, I I like to think that we're just still investigating what Bitcoin is is capable of. I mean, obviously we know for sure some things, right? It's money that holds value over time. What's the limit of that or how far can we go? Um certainly there's a lot of developers who have been active and energized and are looking at new things and you know, to me, I mean, I'm, I try to go into that stuff with an open mind. So, um, I don't think there's any reason to kind of, uh, you know, be afraid of those kind of things. Satoshi himself, you know, dabbled in this ideas that we could link networks of blockchains and, uh, you know, <laughs> unite them with Bitcoin's hashing power. And, uh, you know, uh, again, I think like we should never be like so sure of things to not try something else, right? Like if somebody does have a good idea, it would have been very easy for Satoshi to convince himself not to release Bitcoin, right? There were so many reasons even on the thread, uh, you know, you can see the responses, um, you know, where people really thought that like it was a net negative, right? Like even just suggesting the idea of using this much energy for a system that at that point could have functioned with like three computers, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, it was like, was actually like, offensive to some people, <laughs> you know, they were like, why did you do this? Don't do this. But uh, yeah, I mean, look, I think there's a lot to dig in those emails. Um, you know, we also get some great moments about like Satoshi, like needing a break and like kind of talking about how he's burnt out on the concept and like, can't keep working on it, which I think is kind of humanizes him a little bit. Whereas before he just kind of has unexplained ab absences. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I think the most mysterious kind of thing, I did a thread on this, but, you know, we see this kind of new thing where Satoshi has like a donor or like he refers to like these mysterious donors that he was kind of like interacting oh, with. Yeah. Uh, and that's kind of a big unexplored thread for me where I thought that was like the most curious. Like if I was to highlight like one thing from this email set, that is really play, like right? They received like money to fund the website. Oh, well, I forgot. Yeah, so what happened, it seems, is that Satoshi says, essentially, that he has these donors. And again, they're not really introduced or explained. Uh, and that these donors are willing to give money to the project. And so in order to receive that money, he needs to get uh, Marty to accept that money. Yeah. Because otherwise he'd dox himself. And it seems like he doesn't, <laughs> doesn't want to dox himself. Uh, but then there's this kind of weird like thing where it's like, okay, well, who are these donors? Like, Are these people like offline who are chatting with Satoshi? Like, Who are you know uh, part of like the internet network of the forums? And, or are these just people like he knows casually like who are donors? Like, It was a very confusing thing where it's like the first reference where you can kind of speculate that like, oh, okay, like did other people like know he was Satoshi? Like, Because otherwise, how would he know donors? And like, how would they, they would have had to have known that he was connected to the project in some way right so like what's his relationship with these donors and they do funnel a payment of like thirty five hundred dollars to him mm -hmm. right so there's an actual yeah, yeah. i remember reading that payment they received yeah and i wrote that like you know the cost basis of that donation whoever <laughs> the person made it like they could have bought like sixty thousand bitcoin or something like it was the That's price it? was like seven cents or something <laughs> you know <laughs> so uh hey if you're the u.s government you're still sitting on a, a good chunk of that so uh you know there's a lot, a lot, a lot of inventory there <laughs> i was actually the yeah because i mean the u.s government sitting on i think it's like two hundred and five thousand. yeah it's a lot yeah it's the old silk road because yeah, like, you think bitcoin, like how yeah. much 
God, yeah. Oh, yeah. Like, if you go through the archives, it's, like, really wild. Like, you know, like, uh, Satoshi Dice sold for, like, 600,000 Bitcoin or something. Like, like, like he sold the site for that. And then I think, like, you look at the statements of records because uh, some of the early um, – Bitcoin businesses, they would like publish on Bitcoin talks. They would publish their like statements. Like they would like publish monthly updates. And there was one, I think from MPEX, it was like Merchant Popescu's Pepes exchange where essentially like, you know, their revenue per month is like 20,000 Bitcoin <laughs> like, or something. Like and at that point it was like nothing, yeah. but, you know, and they really were dealing with it. And that, uh, Marty actually tweeted about, you know, just like, cause in one of his emails, he references like just sending 10,000 Bitcoin like very casually. You know, and I think uh, Marty is a really interesting figure because, you know, if you think about somebody who's really important in the history, but like I, he was actually at Bitcoin Amsterdam. He was a speaker mm -hmm. there. And it was funny. Like, he was walking around. Nobody knew he, who he was. You know, I was I went up and I we geeked out for like 20 minutes. Uh, but, you know, he's totally like, you know, receded in the background. But this is a guy who like performed the first U.S. dollar to Bitcoin trade, like priced Bitcoin, like made one of the first large scale purchases, like bought an apartment with Bitcoin, like, you know, could have been a billionaire if he sat and did nothing. But I think, yeah, I, you know, there's an interesting thing with the new Satoshi emails where he is contra ethos to like the, the kind of hodling mentality of today uh, where you had to it was if anybody had just sat around and hodled Bitcoin you know, like where would it have gone, right? Satoshi actually had to build the infrastructure. So this donation that came, it's like they used it to power one of the first exchanges, right? So you need liquidity to launch an exchange and you need to have some sort of inventory, right? You need to buy the domain name. Uh, and so there really was during the first era of Bitcoin up until 2013, like, you know, there was this kind of go forth and like Moving build around. and like give, yeah. give away, you know, like Gavin Andreessen with the Bitcoin faucet, right? Yep. He put 10,000 of his own Bitcoin and then allowed anybody to claim them you know, so they had a different relationship to Bitcoins, right? That like we can't fathom because like to us, it's very expensive. We look at it now and it's like, I checked it the other day, like Bitcoin is very close to flipping like the median household income, like the United median household income in the United States is $74,500. Mm -hmm. And so it's very, in the year of 2024, it's like buying a whole Bitcoin is, is uneconomical for the vast majority of people, even in like developed Western countries. That would be like a lifetime ideal for them. But back then it was so cheap and so unaffordable that like that, the podcast that I was talking about with VJ, where he talks about his introduction to Bitcoin, he like casually laughs about, he he made a bet, he won five Bitcoin and he lost it. And, you know, just never, was, they both laugh, you know, and like, they're just, you just like laugh, chuckling right? out. You just kind of have to laugh, you know, but. Well, but at that point, again, it, like it speaks to the psychology, like myself, I was at conferences, like people handed out, you know, sync coins with Bitcoin on them, like I could have grabbed notes with like five Bitcoin on them. It wasn't like, you know, I, I had a change tip account on my Twitter. I, you know, I don't even I didn't even bother to claim it, you know, when it shut down. I didn't even <laughs> like there was probably close to half a Bitcoin in there, maybe like I, I did. It wasn't even something that I thought of because it was it was insignificant to my like feeble. human. Yeah, this brain. is I mean, this is actually one of the things that I think separates Bitcoin from every other cryptocurrency is like you just can't replicate this uh, immaculate conception, just the first of its kind where it, it was the first digital currency didn't even have a price when it started. People were playing around with it, moving it around, building the infrastructure you know, it's just impossible to replicate that grassroots adoption. Um, now, any other cryptocurrency has to have kind of a founding team. And from the get go, uh, you know, people see it as an investment to like hodl, right? Because it has a price yeah. right from the get go. And usually there's investment to build it. And there's a development team and a founding team. Uh, Bitcoin was very, very different. Just the way it came to being, the way it actually grew and was adopted. Yeah, the word that I uh, use for this is like the spontaneous monetization. Mm, like yeah. you think like that, like that process where it's like, you know, the first life form, it was like there was cells and they were dead and then they like they became life like spontaneous. There was that spontaneous leap that was made right for for no reason or yeah. for some reasons. Right. And here it was uh, Bitcoin was worth nothing and then it leaped and it became value. And in that moment, data was monetizable like in a different way that had ever been conceived. There was like a net kind of leap forward there. Um, I think spontaneous like monetization like kind of capitalized. I don't love it. I need something a little sexier, but like, like you know, there's this leap, right? There's this leap into monetization that occurs from nothingness. And yeah, no other 
cryptocurrency, every other cryptocurrency from that is just something that evolved from that single cell in the same way that we evolved from that single cell. That's one way to look at it. I don't think that's practically true. But like, you know, that that is the scale of the leap that Bitcoin made. And I think it's a testament to like how well engineered Bitcoin is economically, right? Like Bitcoin was getting scarce before it has a price. And one of the interesting things, if you really go back into the forums and look, you get the sense like there's a period like before Bitcoin has a price where people are like, oh, I can't mine this anymore. So like I have to like do something to like try to get it. So like maybe I'll start like a business or like I'll have like a poker tournament or something like so there's this Bitcoin is already like psychologically kind of working on users in ways where it's not priced, it's getting scarce, but then like the participants in the system are like reacting in like profound ways, right? So I, that's why I think like people ask me from like the no corner world, like why I'm confident that Bitcoin will continue. It's like, well, you can see from the very earliest points in the history that like Bitcoin ha was exerting economic pressure on the participants of the network, like e even before it had a price, right? So like if we want to focus on the price now, that's just a representation of something that is organic and naturally occurring outside of that, where in a lot of the other cryptocurrencies, that is not the case. And I think this sort of led to like the 2017 era Silicon Valley sort of like dead end where they... And I guess this is kind of true, right? Like the they have this idea that the users are valuing the network and the network is representing of the of the users, right? Like they sort of made this like weird mental leap to if you just get a community, bunch of users together, right? the, yeah, yeah, the community. cryptocurrency like represents the community. Yeah. And that's still kind of like very ingrained in like most mainstream kind of like crypto lexicon. Like, you know, this is how they justify things like bonk. You know, it's like, well, oh, well, like it has a community of users and like its value is representative of what the community wants. Uh, when in really reality, like this is not, there's no like real fundamental no, yeah. economic force that the thing is observing. If you hear um, like community and if somebody's looking into a coin and they have like a thesis and they say, oh, it's a great community, I would just like run the other way. <laughs> I think that's a good. Well, there is like, I, I would say there's something like curious to that, which is that all cryptocurrencies have a non-zero value, right? So there is this weird paradox where it's like they, they aren't worth nothing, uh, but they aren't Bitcoin, right? So like, what are they, right? Like Bitcoin had the spontaneous monetization. It made this leap from zero to one. It has become valuable because it was always valuable and it was engineered like at a very molecular level to be that. Uh, and these other systems, like they replicate that to a degree. Uh, it's just that they aren't that. And we lack the, I think, human language to like describe like what those two different things mm -hmm. are, right? They're almost like different currents, right? Like, you know, the AC and DC. And then I'm sure there were failed, I don't know, maybe there was a failed electric st electrical standard. Maybe there was BC or CC Probably. or something. No one ever remembers his name. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I don't know. He was the, in third um, place in that race. Nobody cares about him. But I, uh, uh -huh. I agree. I mean, I just I, I feel like, you know, Bitcoin is this unique thing because of the way it's engineered. And I mean, we talk about it all the time, but, you know, the decentralization, the security, uh, the scarcity um, kind of uh -huh. makes it unique. And it just seems like like what you said, it was already there was already economic pressure put on it very early before it even had the price. People were trying to figure out ways to get more Bitcoin. Like, let's throw a poker game. Let's do this. And now fast forward to- Yeah, I think you see your, uh, there's one that was email I would say where Satoshi like is worried about being like identified as somebody who's like monetizing the project, right? So we actually see this here and this is really like kind of the first, you know, we again, we can kind of infer it, right? Like, so you know that Satoshi didn't launch an exchange, he didn't price Bitcoin, he didn't sell Bitcoin. So we know that he was adverse to these ideas, but here we have like in these emails, the actual connection and saying like, no, I don't want to be connected to the, you know, sale of this. I can't be connected yeah. to this. And so we see like a real understanding that like he was aware that like past systems, you know, the people who launched them. And again, I think it's happening. still like a. I think in the emails, right? I, it, it seemed like he was like supportive of those efforts. Oh yeah, he was yeah. supportive of the efforts, which I think is again something we didn't know, right? I think it's it was also kind of unclear how much of the stuff was happening outside of Satoshi because there is a little bit of a void, like before they launch the forums and then after they kind of get going, like really going where there's a lot of user participants, it's kind of unclear like how active Satoshi is and then how much he was working with the other contributors and the two other principal contributors really would have been Marty Malmi, whose emails we have. And then New Liberty Standard, who's kind of like the last of the early figures, who I think is like a major figure. Kind of like, like the first early exchange, Bitcoin right? 
Uh, not really. So it was, New Liberty Standard was a guy. He was a pseudonymous like oh, person I think on I'm the forum. Him for he ran a website. Well, he ran a website where he sold Bitcoin. Okay. But he wasn't an exchange. Okay, okay. So you were buying. You went to his website. You were just buying his Bitcoin. Oh, and really? His contribution okay. was that he priced. Bitcoin. Yeah, he priced it. Okay. So what he was the one who was like, okay, well, I'm not the only one like mining this thing, and I have all these Bitcoin <laughs> that are just laying around. So I was like, what are they worth? Right. So he like performed the first and he posts this kind of public calculation, which is like, here's how many hours I spent like on computing power to make these Bitcoins. And he came to the, the realization that they were worth like a third of a penny, like each or like, mm -hmm. you know, I think it's even less mm -hmm. than that, right? like something where like 50 Bitcoins was worth, I don't know, like, uh, five, sorry, 50,000 Bitcoins was worth like a couple bucks. Right. So he comes to like some price equation. And here we get to see Satoshi being like, oh, yeah, that's really cool. Like, I would do it that way precisely, but that's something like we can work off that, right? There's this idea that like pricing Bitcoin and like understanding the economics is like a communal activity. But yeah, New Liberty Standard's specific contribution is like he priced Bitcoin. He has this like weird idea of like energy because like back then, you know, they you know, they really could just plug a computer in and make Bitcoin. <laughs> so like and like so they had a very passive understanding of it too, where like they didn't really fully aware that they were going to get priced out at some point they were still kind of like oh well if i just plug a computer in and i put a certain amount of time that time equals money and so that money this is the calculation they use yeah but a very fascinating and like yeah he would be the last kind of early contributor who's like emails and like even identity like there's been a there's been an individual who was claimed to be him though there's there's some so, <laughs> this is where you get really into the lore there's a dispute over whether he is him uh but like yeah there's uh i'd say he's the last kind of like big early contributor who i'm like if we get his email dump as well that's like the one that i'm holding out for but this was a couple big ones right adam was the the one where we were just hoping there was some substantive conversation there yeah. between him and Satoshi. And then Marty was really the trove, right? Cause they were the tightest collaborators and Hal has already released his emails. So, you know, there's some, there's some uh, things we get there. And then Mike Hearn would be the little, like kind of last one who's also publicly released his emails. Uh, but yeah, I don't know. I've, I've talked with other people who have said that had conversations with Satoshi. Like, so I went back three or four years ago and I went through all the early forum handles and I was able to kind of, I don't know, do some identity tracing there. Uh, I had conversations with people who said that they've had conversations with Bitcoin who said, oh, sorry, with Satoshi who said that they would pass on things to me. Uh, but uh, I'm waiting for those to arrive. Yeah. I just think it's fascinating to come up with a price based off like basically the cost of production. It's a, it's kind of yeah. a fascinating thing. Right? Well, that actually, you know, that was Satoshi's actual issue with it was like, he was like, oh, well, this is like a, a sort of like communist sort of cost of production sort of thing. And that, that, that economic theory is wrong. Mm -hmm. Right. Like, but he's like, it's good enough for us to get started. So it is actually kind of funny where it's like, if you are a diehard Austrian, <laughs> like, you know, you believe that value is subjective. Well, one of the way, first ways Bitcoin was priced was via the cost of production model, which is the, in, that, in fact, the exact thing that Austrian economics. Yeah, is. <laughs> it's, it's really funny. <laughs> um, yeah. Well, you know, I, I, I have to say it like t this morning, there's one person that claimed to be Craig Wright or Satoshi, and that was Craig mm -hmm. Wright for all these years. And it, it caused all these headaches, sued people. Um, Everyone, you know, who is educated even a little bit in Bitcoin could see through uh, his claims, but it took a long, long time for, and, and for the, the courts to finally say he is not Satoshi Nakamoto. And that happened this morning. There's kind of celebration. Uh, have any takeaways about that? I mean, I, I just think it's great. Like, hopefully we can just move on and, and this will be the last time I mention his name. But uh, I wanted to get your thoughts since you followed, you know, the Satoshi uh, you know, story, I guess, so closely over the years. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, obviously great that the community can move on from from Craig Wright, uh, though I know that there's still some pending, uh, you know, things to happen in court. And also, uh, you know, <clears throat> this is not an official final ruling, though we did get the judge kind of being so offended by court Craig Wright's case that he was compelled to give his verdict <laughs> a bit early. We still are waiting for that final verdict. Uh, but yeah, look, tremendous, uh, tremendous applause to the people who contributed. I mean, I think people outside the industry really don't understand what a huge scale this court case has been, right? I think from the people at Chain Code Labs to Jack Dorsey, uh, yeah. who have invested a lot of time and resources to 
you know, great contributors of Bitcoin whose time has been eaten by this for years, like Peter Todd, Greg Maxwell, Peter Woolley. I mean, some of the really great early developers who were really discouraged from working on Bitcoin because of these litigations. Uh, they've really decimated Bitcoin development and especially the people who have contributed arguably the most to it. Uh, so just an awful chapter of the Bitcoin history that I think we can close, uh, hopefully definitively, because there is one person on earth now who's definitively, according to a court, not, not for Soshi Nakamoto. So we can all move forward and, uh, you know, have our t-shirts in peace, I guess. Yeah. Shout out to Hoddle Knot and, and Peter McCormick, who personally, yeah. uh, you know, had to fight this in the courts. And I think Peter tweeted that we are all Satoshi, except, except Craig Wright. <laughs> to this. Yeah, he actually tweeted at uh, Elon Musk, which I thought was pretty funny, saying that the Craig Wright's now impersonating Satoshi on on, on X, so he must be removed. So I'm actually curious if that uh, if that gets if he gets a uh, he gets stricken from the platform on that basis. It'd be interesting. Well, um, you know, we talked about how back in the day. I mean, it was just crazy to think about now with people sending tens of thousands of Bitcoin. I mean, do you think we're going to say the same thing 10 years from now, given Bitcoin's monetary policy, where we're just going to think it's insane that people were sending whole Bitcoins around? Um, You know, what are your thoughts there? Yeah, it it seems very likely. I mean, uh, (laughs) I think if you're... If you have a few spare sats, I would I would try to hold on to them all you can, right? CK uh, Christian Carolus loves to say that uh, thirty seven sats, oh, yeah. right? That's the last. <laughs> that's the last block reward. He's like, all you need in order to be a Bitcoin, to really make it, is you need thirty seven sats, right? That's how. Uh, and you know, he uses that to basically argue you're not bullish enough if you don't think that like you can be, you can like build a legacy off thirty seven sats. Uh, so I've always found that to be like kind of a funny way to look at it because you know it's true i mean you know at some point in the future history or sorry in the future uh computing networks infinitely larger than what is currently going to power bitcoin could be com- competing for the amount of dust in your wallet that like, you wouldn't even bother to take so make sure to sweep those swan accounts when you you know make sure yeah, you dust the yeah. floor on the wall out, sweep you know? the dust consolidate those utxos too so just good management yeah. um well this is a fun conversation. I, I geek out on this history stuff, so I appreciate uh, all your work. Um, looking forward to that book one day. I, I know you're working on one. Yeah. And, uh, I'll make sure we get some of the Swan HQ. Yeah, <laughs> yeah and I... Uh, Dude, you guys aren't acquired by some mega bank at that point. Oh, man. Yeah. Well, that would be interesting, yeah. wouldn't it? Uh, but <laughs> <laughs> I don't think that's the plan, but you know, I'm not in charge of that. But. I do want to see. I, I do want to see this cycle. I want to see a some Bitcoin company buy a bank. I really yeah. Think I, that's think that's the, one, yeah I think that's the. I think really more haven't likely. seen like a mid scale, you know, like kind of regional, like bank where there's some branches, you know. So maybe I'll just put that on. Yeah, the Yeah, there's going to be a rise of Bitcoin yeah. banks, and uh, you know, it's just going to be fun to see the Bitcoin companies continue to thrive. I mean, uh, the companies yeah. you work for too. I mean, the whole ecosystem is going to rise because I think we're just right about this technology. I mean, straight up and. It's crazy working in it too, because you realize kind of how small the industry still is, um, even though we've grown so much. Um, there's just so much growth to be had still, and I'm excited to have Bitcoin, Bitcoiners, kind of leading some of the the biggest companies in the world um, in the coming decade. I'm really bullish on Bitcoiners in general. Um, yeah, I still think we get some fight ahead of us. That's the only thing I would say to the community. I, you know, I still think that we have inroads to make. Our, I, I think we're in a war for ideological supremacy, and I, and I don't think, and I often say this to Bitcoiners, it's like I don't think Bitcoin maximalism is the, you know, pejorative view right of the world, right? And that's the that to me is the fight, right? It's like we're still fighting the crypto apparatus that is essentially distorting this view yeah. and lobbying for this view. We're still fighting. The sort of Washington D.C. Gary Gensler-led SEC apparatus, you know, which is sort of opposed to everything. Uh, and you know, uh, we've this is a small gain. We have new allies, uh, but uh, you know, the 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 it's a long risk game. You know, I once read about a guy who played a game of risk. You know, risk like the board game. Yeah, yeah, I love risk. Yeah, there's so there's a guy on Reddit a few years ago who like he uh, he had a viral post where it was like he played a game of risk, but every individual battle battle was Stratego. Stratego is awesome. I love that game too. Yeah. Okay, so like every single battle between every country was like strate- was an individual game of Stratego, and he said he'd been doing it for like 15 years. <laughs> <laughs> playing a it single game, right? so like it's a big, it's a long, it's a long game, game. You know, it's, it's, it's risk is a long game in itself, man. That's like a rainy day. Well, that's what's so that's what's know. so wild about that. Yeah. Like you know, 
because it's a great idea but like also it's like you know that's a that's some very that's some intense dedication and then like game gameplay mashups you know yeah i think you know um i think that's a good point i mean we still have a lot of hearts to win over and, and a lot of education to be done um well, it depends on what the end goal is, right? I think like the ETF is a bit deceiving. I think it it uh, you know in some ways is being paraded as this kind of Bitcoin IPOs or Bitcoin goes mainstream kind of thing, and then it sort of asks us as people in the industry to sort of self reflect and it's like, okay, I was like, is are we done? No, like, no we're, I don't think we're done at all. And you know, I think the conflation of of cryptocurrencies and with Bitcoin, just understanding the differences between them. I mean, it takes a little bit. It's nuanced and. Um, but it seems like the bear market kind of helps clear that out. Um, some of these blowups that have happened um, has helped as well because, you know, it just separates Bitcoin. And I just read a Financial Times article um, from somebody. I forgot I forgot who the author was, but he he is a pretty significant role um, in traditional finance. And he was just saying how Bitcoin has kind of separated itself. Um, and that was the most important line of the article, I thought, because that showed that he kind of understood the differences. And so bear markets help with that, I would say. Um, and it's better, I think, that people, are, if their first touch point is with an ETF of Bitcoin rather than maybe these other cryptocurrencies, you know, personally, I think that's probably a better first touch point if they're gonna get there. <laughs> like, that's kind of my uh -huh. point. Um, yeah. But, uh, you know, I, maybe I like to end with just like one of my favorite excerpts from the Satoshi emails, which was, until now, no scarce commodity that can be traded over a communications channel without a trusted third party has been available. If there is a desire to take up a form of money that can be traded over the internet without a trusted third party, then now that is possible. And so here we are today. Uh, so thank you, Satoshi. And thank you, Pete Rizzo, uh, for joining Swan Signal Live. Um, if people want to follow your work, uh, where, can they, uh, where, can they, where can I send them? And uh, just let them know. Sure. Go to uh, Twitter, Pete underscore Rizzo underscore. You can also go to Pete uh, That's where I collect some of my writings and interviews and things. Uh, but uh, yeah, appreciate it. Uh, give me a follow. And uh, thanks for being here. Thanks for all the work you do in terms of uh, getting people onboarded and uh, into the self-custody, right? The way Satoshi intended. Absolutely. Absolutely. 100%. Self-custody to those sats. Use them in a sovereign way. Well, thanks, Pete. Have a great uh, rest of your day. Really appreciate it, my man. Uh, well, I enjoyed that. Um, like I said, Pete is, Pete is a wealth of knowledge. I mean, having been a journalist and covering this space since 2013, he's he's pretty much seen it all. Um, and so it's been a crazy ride, but here we are in 2024. Things are looking really exciting. Uh, and Bitcoin just seems to be really maturing and getting on the radars of the entire world. And so thanks again, Pete. That was a fun conversation. If you guys enjoyed it, make sure you follow this channel, subscribe. Um, that just helps us get our message out there to the world that Bitcoin is the best money in the world and you should self-custody your sats. So go give us a follow if you don't. Subscribe to this channel. Like, comment, let me know what you thought of the episode. We got another excellent episode lined up next week. So make sure you, you stay tuned for that. And with that, I am out. Thank you.